Hello and welcome to another episode of Coding Secrets. This episode is a little different in that it is less of a coding trick than it is a methodology trick. Back when we were making 16-bit games, there were no real tools as such for game development, so you had to write your own. Typically, you would write a utility like a map editor on a PC and then export the data into the game. I realised after my first couple of games that it would be way better to have editor functionality built right into the game so that you could quickly test and tweak things without having the whole pipeline from PC to the console and restarting the game each time to see if things worked correctly. So this is just a quick look at the creature editor I built into Toy Story on the Sega Mega Drive, or Genesis if you're American. So you can see here that the editor is running and you have a cursor that you can move around using the joypad. You also have a bunch of pull-down menus at the top of the screen to perform various actions. Select Creature, for instance, allows you to move around the various creatures you have already placed in the level. By the way, you can see it's called Mickey Editor at the top of the screen. It's based on the editor I created for Mickey Mania, but with a few less options. So let's have a look at the various things the editor can do. Move X and Y pause allows you to move the creature's position around the level. Let's place this train on this shelf here. Now we can see that the train doesn't stop at the edge of the shelf as it was set up to stop near the waste paper basket when it was on the floor. To fix this we can use the path box option. This allows us to specify how far the train goes before it turns around so we can easily tweak it to keep the train on the shelf. We also have an option called the range box. This box specifies when the train is drawn and moved, so if the box is on screen, the train is processed. If the box goes off the screen, the train will disappear. This is used to save processor time, sprite usage and DMA memory transfers when the train isn't visible. The box should cover the range of movement of the train to avoid seeing it being clipped off screen early. We could leave the box small like this, but that will clip off the bubble particles early, so it's better to include them in the box as well. The collision box option just displays the rectangle that will be checked against the player to detect any collisions. It was defined in a separate PC editor that was also used to cut up the animation frames into as few sprites as possible. You could specify a different collision box per frame of animation if needed, like on this plane. It was fine doing this on a PC, as it wasn't something you'd need to tweak in-game much. We'll skip the creature type options for now and move on to the anim frame rate. This allows you to specify how quickly to animate the sprite, so we could set it to every 8 frames like this. Or every 3 frames. I've no idea why that changes the background to white though. Ironically, setting the rate to every 4 frames allows the wheels on this train to perfectly track the floor, but I set it to twice as fast in the final game as I preferred the smoother animation. Let's come back to DMA on frame number later and instead move on to VRAM location. Every creature needs its own area of video RAM for the animations to load into, otherwise they would corrupt each other. This memory map shows any video RAM currently being used. If the creature is out of range, it won't use any video memory until it's on screen again. You can see how much memory your current creature needs and can pick an empty space to place it in. Let's move on to the Attrib menu and look at Palette Number. This basically lets you pick which palette to draw your creature with from the four that are available. The high pry and low pry options are used for if you want the creature to go in front or behind certain background objects. The next option is attack type, and this just specifies if the creature can damage the player, the player damages the creature, they damage each other, or no damage to anyone. A character like Ham for instance won't hurt Woody, but the player might need collision with Ham to get him to move or drop coins. Number of hit points specifies how many hits the character will take before it dies, ranging from none if it's not a creature you can hit, all the way up to infinite if it's indestructible. And then finally on this menu, Crete Plat just tells the game whether a creature should be treated as a platform that the player can stand on or not. 
as the moving platforms in the game are basically just creatures that don't hurt you. The next menu is titled None, as it was an old menu used in Mickey Mania that Toy Story didn't need. The final menu is called Utils, and has Cut, Copy, Paste and Clear All. Cut will delete a creature, Copy will copy a creature's information into a clipboard, Paste will copy whatever is in the clipboard over the currently selected creature, and Clear All deletes all the creatures in one go. Let's try copying and pasting the train we moved earlier. First we copy it into the clipboard. Then we select the creature we want to copy over, so let's pick this plane. Then we paste over it. Then we can go find it again. We can see it here, but it's corrupted. That's because it's a copy of the other train and they are now using the same VRAM or video memory. So let's go into the VRAM menu and pick some empty space for the new train. There we go, no corruption now. Finally, we go to one of the menu items I didn't mention before, DMA on frame number. A DMA is a special command that can copy graphics from the ROM cartridge to the video RAM very quickly. However, it is very limited per frame. Currently, both these trains are DMAing their graphics on the same frame, using double the DMA that they could. As they animate every two frames, we could DMA one train on the first frame and the next train on the second frame. That's what this menu allows. You can tell the game which frame to DMA on, allowing you to maximise the DMA available per frame. If we slow the video right down, we can see that they now animate on alternate frames. Now, the final menu option is Creature Type. I left this one until last, as it has the potential to crash the game. But this menu allows you to pick which creature you want to place or manipulate. You can see every creature in the game listed in this menu. But let's pick the snake and see what happens. Ok, so the snake is there for a frame and keeps vanishing, so we need to set up the path and range boxes. Ok, there it is, but it's definitely the wrong colour, so let's find the right palette. There we go, now we just need to slow down its animation speed. That looks better, seems to be tracking the ground correctly now at least. Let's tweak its path so it stays on the shelf. Great. And there we go, that's a quick look at the Toy Story in-game editor, a coding secret that certainly sped up production of this game. It was the first game ever to launch the same day as a movie, and that meant we had to create the whole thing in just six months. Okay, until next time, bye bye.